Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. To my bed crimers, I hope you're having a great day. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. As always, I just ask that if after listening to and or watching the video you find you enjoyed it or learned something, do me a solid and smash that like button. Now let's dig in. Actor Ashton Kutcher, who has come under fire of late for writing a character letter to support his buddy, convicted essayer, actor Danny Masterson, may have felt pressured to do so because of some alleged skeletons in his own closet. This bed crime story begins back in 2001, when Kutcher was just starting out in his acting career. He wasn't yet a household name, but he was on his way thanks to his role on That 70s Show, which Masterson also starred in. Kutcher and Masterson became best buds while working on the show, practically brothers. Back then, Kutcher was beginning to get to know a pretty 22-year-old fashion design student named Ashley Ellerin, whom he'd met two months earlier in December of 2000 at a party hosted by actor Josh Hartnett. Ellerin, who had also dated Vin Diesel and Vince Vaughn, was studying at LA's Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. She also had a part-time gig stripping at a Hollywood club. One of her childhood friends named Carolyn Mernick later wrote about Ellerin in her book, The Hot One, a memoir of friendship, sex, and murder. Carolyn described Ellerin living a very wild life in Hollywood and being a far cry from her childhood friend. Having moved from Northern California to Hollywood, where she was renting a split-level bungalow within walking distance of the Kodak Theater, and the famous Walk of Fame, Ashley Ellerin was definitely living in LA's fast lane. According to Carolyn, tanning religiously and getting manicures and pedicures every week because she couldn't risk having even one chip. Carolyn also says Ellerin mentioned things like having the lease on her BMW paid for by a guy in his 50s, crystal meth use, having an hourly rate for interactions with men, and although Ellerin was attracting Hollywood hotties like Ashton Kutcher, she was also attracting at least one weirdo. Unfortunately, Ellerin had one blind spot that would later prove fatal. She was trusting to a fault, somewhat naive, and her creeper meter was non-existent. Kutcher would later admit that he was seeing several women at the same time when he met Ellerin, and he did not consider Ellerin his girlfriend. On February 21st, Kutcher and Ellerin had plans for their first date, dinner and drinks. Kutcher, who had been to Ellerin's home about two weeks earlier for a housewarming party, was to pick her up there at 8 p.m. But the plans changed when he stopped off at a friend's house to watch part of the Grammys, which were on that night. He called Ellerin around 7.30 p.m. to say he was running late. Kutcher called her again to keep her posted on his whereabouts and timeline. At one point, he left a voicemail. Then Ellerin called him back from her roommate, Jennifer DeSisto's phone, saying the house phone wasn't working. It was 8.24 p.m. when they spoke. She told Kutcher she was just out of the shower and was about to dry her hair. So she was not concerned that he was running late because she was also running late. And as I'm narrating this, I'm wondering if the reason the phone wasn't working at the house was because the phone line had been cut by the perpetrator. That's just me speculating. Kutcher called Ellerin again shortly after 10 p.m. as he was driving over to her house, but she didn't pick up. The actor arrived at the home between 10.30 and 10.45 p.m., and he immediately noticed several things. One, the front security gate was open. Two, the lights were on inside the house. And three, Ellerin's maroon BMW was in the driveway. Kutcher said he went in through the open gate and knocked on the front door, but no one answered. Now, this is where the story leads to skeletons in Kutcher's past. There are actually two versions of the next part of the story. One is the story Ashton Kutcher told the police and later testified to in court. 
The other is what really happened, allegedly, at least according to Danny Masterson's ex-girlfriend, Chrissy Cornell Bixler, and a guy named Aaron Levin of the YouTube channel Growing Up in Scientology. Let's begin with version number one, meaning what Kutcher told the police and later testified to in court. Ashton said that when Ellerin didn't answer the door, he peered into the home through a window to the left of the front door. He said the place was in disarray, but that wasn't shocking because Ellerin was in the middle of moving in and remodeling the house. Kutcher also told the cops that he noticed a dark red stain that looked like someone had spilled wine near the entrance to Ashley's bedroom. Assuming she'd bailed on him because he was so late, Ashton said he left. A half hour earlier, so let's say around 10 p.m., Ellerin's new roommate, Jennifer DeSisto, also dropped by the house briefly. She had left her keys in her boyfriend's car and was hoping Ashley Ellerin could let her in. Spotting Ellerin's car in the driveway and seeing the lights on inside, DeSisto, like Kutcher, knocked on the front door. When she, too, got no answer, she went back to her boyfriend's house where she ended up spending the night. The next morning, the reason for Ellerin's failure to answer Answer the door the previous evening becomes apparent. DeSisto, having retrieved her keys, returns to the bungalow around 8.30 a.m. A few steps into the house, she gets the shock of a lifetime. Dressed in a greenish turquoise terry cloth robe, silk boxer shorts that are bunched around her thighs, and a blue camisole that is stretched around her torso, Ellerin lies face up in a pool of blood. Her body is sprawled on a carpeted landing leading to the two bedrooms. Her face is blue. At first, DeSisto thinks it's a practical joke, but as she gets closer, it's impossible to miss all the blood. It's trailing from Ashley's nose and mouth and matted in her hair. It covers her arms and legs and hands in a shiny, slick layer. It drenches the carpet around her body in a dark, angry red. It's a sight that DeSisto can still remember vividly to this day. She described that moment for 48 hours, saying, quote, I remember it like it was yesterday. I entered the house and Ashley was laying across the two stairs, absolutely blue and covered in blood, end quote. Paramedics pronounced Ashley dead at 9.28 a.m. on February 22nd. An external examination of the body revealed 47 wounds, 12 of which were deemed fatal. Her neck organs had suffered extensive trauma. In fact, only her spinal cord had kept her head from being detached. Her windpipe and right artery had been cut in two. She also sported numerous defensive wounds on her hands and right forearm. One of the blows actually penetrated her skull and took a chunk out of it like a puzzle piece. Clearly, Ashley had put up a fight. A Hollywood detective named Tom Small noticed that the position of the body seemed odd, as if Ellerin had been moved and posed. To Small, this spelled a possible serial killer. Ashley was officially identified at 11 p.m. via DOJ fingerprints. An hour later, a local police sergeant was sent to notify her parents in Northern California. California. Her father was particularly shocked because he'd been to visit Ashley on the morning of February 21st. He'd just seen her alive and well. Kutcher would later tell the authorities that he learned the horrible news that Ellerin had been done in upon waking up. He also said he was freaking out because he knew he'd touched the bungalow's front door. With his DNA squarely at the crime scene, Kutcher feared the police would think he was the perpetrator, so he proactively called them to share his story. But there was also another man who was freaking out about his contact with the bungalow and Ellerin on the day she died. The manager of Ellerin's rental house, Mark Durbin, whom Ellerin had been flirting with since she moved in, had gotten intimate with Ashley between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. on February 21st. Durbin lived across the street with his girlfriend, 
Durbin told Detective Small that he left Ellerin's home at about 8.15 p.m. Thanks to all these encounters, it was easy for the cops to put together a timeline. Durbin also alerted the cops that around 10 p.m., he glanced out of his window and saw a figure walking back and forth in front of Ellerin's home. It was, presumably, her killer. If only Durbin could have gone over there and shooed the guy away. For Kutcher, there was only one problem with his story. Detective Small knew that it would have been impossible for him to have seen red wine or anything else spilled on the carpet from the window he said he peered in through. There simply wasn't a view from that window to where blood drenched the carpet. For Kutcher to have seen something red on the carpet meant that he had to have been inside the home. Despite Kutcher's fib, the investigators quickly ruled him out. They also ruled out Mark Dirk. Urban. Shockingly, it would appear that Kutcher arrived just minutes after the perpetrator had departed. In fact, if Kutcher touched Ellerin's body, he would have felt its warmth. Now, recently, it's come out thanks to Danny Masterson's ex-girlfriend, who, along with two other women, took Masterson to trial for drugging and essaying them back in the early 2000s. What Kutcher told the cops is not exactly what happened allegedly. Another man named Aaron Levin also supports the ex-girlfriend's story. Levin has said he spoke to a source within the LAPD who said the same thing, but because I haven't seen any documents to prove this, I'm going to cover my mm, derriere and use the term allegedly. Bixler claims that on the night of February 21st, she was sitting next to Danny Masterson when the phone rang sometime after 10.45 p.m. It was Ashton Kutcher. Masterson had him on speakerphone. From the safety of his car outside Ellerin's bungalow, Kutcher told Masterson a very scary story. He explained that when Ellerin didn't answer the door, he tried the doorknob. The door opened, he went inside, and to his utter horror, he saw Ellerin lying dead in a pool of blood. She'd been jabbed a gazillion times. Can you imagine? He must have been like, am I high? Is this what I'm seeing? Is this real? Certain Ellerin was dead. Kutcher allegedly exited the house and called Masterson and his agent. Kutcher knew this was a tricky situation for an upcoming actor to be in, as did his agent. They advised him that if he called the police, he would forever be associated with this horrendous crime and that it would likely ruin his career. So he drove away from the crime scene and did not call the police and left Ellerin lying there for her poor roommate to discover. If this story is true, then for all these years, Danny Masterson has known that Kutcher allegedly lied to the police about what he really saw and did on the night of Ellerin's death. Let me make it clear though, no one is saying Kutcher is responsible for Ellerin's death. He has been 100% cleared of any wrongdoing, so don't get that twisted. Some people feel that Masterson and his family maybe used Kutcher's dirty little secret to pressure him into writing a character letter for Masterson. That is pure speculation, however. It's just as possible that no one had to coax Kutcher and his wife Mila Kunis to write letters in support of Danny Masterson. About 50 people in total wrote such letters in the hopes that the judge would be more lenient in his sentencing. Actor Giovanni Rabisi also wrote a letter for Danny Masterson. I'm sure Kutcher and Kunis, and probably Rabisi too, didn't realize their letters were going to be made public. Had they known, you'd think they would have been reticent to do that because they are now dealing with a shitstorm of criticism and backlash for saying very nice things about a convicted and violent S. Air. And by the way, more women who knew Masterson back in the day are coming forward to say that they too were allegedly abused by him. 
But the problem with Kutcher not dialing 911 on February 21st of 2001 to report Ellerin's death is much deeper than him just putting his career over getting the police to the house as soon as possible. It turns out Ellerin's killer, a guy named Michael Thomas Garzulo, is a serial killer. And after doing in Ellerin in 2001, he went on to take the life of another young woman, mother of four, 32-year-old Maria Bruno, in 2005. Bruno was killed in her home in El Monte, east of Los Angeles. During the crime, Garzulo gruesomely cut off Bruno's breasts and removed her implants. He also stuck one of her breasts in her mouth. What a sicko. Bruno was jabbed 17 times in all. Garzulo's MO was to use blitz-style knife assaults on his victims, who all lived nearby him, when they were attacked. I can't help thinking about Brian Koberger, who is currently facing charges for the Blitz-style attack on the four University of Idaho students in November of 2022. When Ellerin was killed, the police did have their sights on Garzulo, supposedly according to Aaron Levin. But when they realized that Kutcher had lied about his own actions that night, that he had been inside the house, that he was the one who found Ellerin dead, and he'd opted not to call the cops, they felt there would be too much reasonable doubt for a jury to convict Garzulo at trial. So they opted not to arrest him at that time. Because of this, it could be argued that the other women died unnecessarily because of Kutcher's selfish actions, allegedly, on the night of Ellerin's death. Had Garzulo been arrested and convicted for causing Ellerin's death in 2001, then Maria Bruno would likely still be alive, and another young woman may have avoided a frightening attack by Garzulo on her life that still causes her trauma to this day. That last incident took place on April 28th of 2008, when Garzulo broke into 28-year-old Michelle Murphy's apartment in Santa Monica, California. Murphy was in bed sleeping when she awoke to Garzulo on top of her. Murphy, who was slashed in the arms and hands, miraculously managed to fight off the attack. She drew her knees into her chest and then thrust them out onto Garzulo, sending him flying off the bed. He actually fled her home, but in so doing, he left a trail of his own blood, which meant that he also left his DNA behind. Two months later, Garzulo was arrested by the Santa Monica police. So finally, this monster was behind bars. Two years later, in July of 2011, Garzulo was also charged with first-degree murder for a crime dating back to 1993, when he was 17 years old and still living with his parents in Glenview, Illinois. In fact, it's believed Garzulo moved from Illinois to California to avoid scrutiny by the Illinois police. In this 1993 case, 18-year-old Trisha Picacho, a young woman who lived in the same neighborhood as Garzulo, was discovered jabbed to death on the stoop of her family home in August of that year. Her father, as he stepped outside to take the family dog for a walk, came across his daughter's lifeless body. The case had remained cold for all those years. It wasn't until 2019, at the age of 43, that Michael Garzulo was finally convicted of doing in both Ashley Ellerin and Maria Bruno and attempting to kill Michelle Murphy. He was sentenced to death. However, thus far, he's managed to avoid that sentence because California hasn't executed anyone since 2006, and Governor Gavin Newsom has halted executions for as long as he's in office. So this very scary, dangerous killer currently sits on death row enjoying treats from the canteen while Ellerin's parents live in what they describe as, quote, an altered, diminished, heartbreaking life, end quote. I'm sure the same is true of Bruno's family, 
and Trisha Picasso's as well. So now let me tell you more about this scary serialist, Michael Garzullo, his MO and how Ellerin came to fall within his sights. By the way, I think if you look at Garzullo's trajectory as a serial killer, you can see how he fits the pattern experts often cite. He started his killing spree, at least that we know of, at age 17 with Trisha Picasso's death. Then he moved on to do in Ellerin and Bruno and to attempt to take Murphy's life as well. It's possible he committed other crimes, but no one has yet made those connections. Garzullo is a former air conditioning and heater repairman, a former bouncer, and a former aspiring actor. He'd even once been electrocuted on the job. Too bad that didn't take him out before he harmed these beautiful young women. Sorry, not sorry. His MO was finding pretty young women near where he lived, shadowing them, stalking them, planning his attack, and then breaking into their homes and using a sharp object to destroy them. He got a sexual thrill from his crime. Crimes. His special sauce was that on the surface, he looked like a regular Joe. Some might even have said back in the day that he was handsome. I think he looks like a nutter, but that's just me. At six feet two inches tall with a dragon tattoo on his back, Garzulo was both imposing and eye-catching. His arms were ripped with muscles thanks to boxing sessions and workouts at the local gym. He also practiced martial arts and had tried his hand at acting, landing a role in a student movie. But below his surface, the heart of a serial psychosexual killer was beating. Ellerin had actually met this monster in the weeks before her death when Garzulo inserted himself into her world. He lived less than a block away from her Hollywood bungalow, and one day when she was outside with a friend fixing a flat tire on her BMW, Garzulo strolled over and introduced himself. He gave her his card and said he was an AC and heating repairman. After that meeting, Garzulo fixed Ellerin's furnace, and he also disturbingly started turning up at her house without an invitation. He even crashed one of her parties. But here's where Ellerin's blind spot failed her. She wasn't bothered by Garzulo's creeper vibe. Her friends thought he was certifiably cray-cray and told her so, but she blew it off. On the night she died, as I told you earlier, Ellerin had just gotten out of the shower and was about to blow dry her hair. It's believed that the then 24-year-old Garzulo attacked her from behind shortly after 10 p.m., which makes you wonder how things would have played out if Kutcher had turned up any earlier. Would Ellerin still be alive? And what if Kutcher arrived earlier when the crime was going down? Would he be simply a name on paper? as another victim alongside Ellerin who died that night? Or would Garzulo simply have postponed his plans to harm Ellerin? Her body, which was found lying outside the entrance to the bathroom and on the landing to the bedrooms face up, wasn't officially discovered until about 8.30 a.m., as I told you. And again, I say officially because it would appear that Kutcher discovered Ellerin's body shortly after she was killed, allegedly. It took years for the cops to finally get enough evidence to link Garzulo to Ellerin and Bruno's deaths. Garzulo is currently awaiting trial for the 1993 crime against Trisha Picaccio. If convicted, he will face 25 more years in prison on top of his life sentence. Garzulo was linked to Trisha's death through his DNA. Here's how that crime went down. Trisha lived in a quiet cul-de-sac in the same neighborhood where Michael Garzulo lived with his parents. On August 14th of 1993, between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., someone approached the pretty and petite Trisha as she sat on a stoop outside her family home. She'd been to a pool party at a neighbor's house earlier that evening. Her attacker twisted her left arm so hard that it snapped. He then plunged a sharp object into her body a half a dozen times. By the time he was finished, she had deep wounds to her heart, lungs, abdomen, arm, collarbone, and back. The next morning, as Trisha's father exited the door, 
to walk the dog, he spotted two tennis shoes sticking up. Upon a closer look, he realized it was Trisha. He immediately fell to his knees and began screaming. The cries pierced the cul-de-sac's quiet morning air. Trisha's mother came rushing down, and when she saw what happened, she blacked out. Both parents were taken to the hospital in shock. Michael Garzullo moved to L.A. in 1998, allegedly to escape the scrutiny of the police in Illinois. Trisha, unbeknownst to her parents, had Garzullo's DNA on her fingernails after she died. Back in 1993, DNA technology wasn't what it is today. The police took the fingernail clippings and stored them in hopes that when the technology improved, they could be tested. Trisha's case went cold for 13 years. In 2006, so five years after Ashley Ellerin died, Hollywood detective Tom Small called Trisha's parents. Small was in Chicago, investigating similarities between Trisha's death and Ellerin's. During the conversation, Small dropped a bomb on the family. Were they aware that in 2003, the DNA of a suspect in Ellerin's murder, a man named Michael Garzullo, had been matched to DNA found on Trisha's fingernails. The parents were shocked and replied no. No one had bothered to tell them about this DNA match. Before Garzullo moved to L.A. in the late 1990s, he'd been inside Trisha's home a few times. He was a friend of her younger brother, Doug. Although Garzullo and Trisha attended Glenbrook South High School at the same time, they were not friends. Garzullo had a reputation around the neighborhood as being a bully with a short fuse and a volatile temper. Trisha's parents wanted to know why, after this DNA match was made, Garzullo hadn't been charged. They were told at the time that there wasn't enough evidence. Because Garzullo had been in the home before, their home, the prosecutors were worried that defense attorneys could successfully argue that the DNA wound up on Trisha's fingernails through casual contact. The family found this story absurd. They knew Garzullo's DNA should not have been on their daughter's fingernails. Garzullo would not be arrested until 2008 when his blood was found at the home of Michelle Murphy. Think about this. The Picachos were told about the DNA evidence in 2006, and yet they had to wait another two years for Garzullo to be arrested. That had to have been absolute hell for them. It wasn't until May of 2011 when two new witnesses came forward in response to an episode on 48 Hours Mystery about Trisha's case that Garzullo was finally charged with her death. The witnesses told the cops that sometime in the late 1990s, so several years after Trisha's death, Garzullo told them that he had killed her. Because the witnesses were rock solid, their evidence finally prompted the Cook County State's attorney, Anita Alvarez, to charge Garzullo with Trisha's death. Many have criticized Cook County, Illinois, for failing to act sooner. If they had, maybe Ellerin and Bruno would still be alive. So that's the wild case of Michael Garzullo, otherwise known as the Hollywood Ripper. And that's how Ashton Kutcher found himself wrapped up in a murder case and now finds himself embroiled in controversy. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.